Uh, yes, sir. So this is going to be for the camera and the live stream. Okay. For the house, we have a podium mic here, and there is also another lavalier that we can we can double mic you with if you if you want to use that as well. Okay, I'll, I'll just stay here and okay. talk into that mic. That should be fine. There you go. Okay. Hi, Carolyn. <laughs> How are you? Good, good, good to see you. So you settled in now? You've yeah, almost. Almost? But you've been here six, six months. Oh, you came in March, OK. Excellent. Did you start teaching this fall? I taught in the spring. You taught in the spring? Yeah, a lot of things. But now I have a prep. Now, that doesn't screw up your tenure clock, does it? No. Yeah. Okay. At, 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 Dart at, at Dartmouth, they've got this crazy thing where the tenure clock starts. Now I'm going back to I'm going back to uh, New Hampshire. Yeah. So we have a flight on Sunday to Boston, and, and we'll Sunday drive. To Boston. Yeah. yeah. So tomorrow is Disneyland, and Saturday is Harry Potter. I, mean, I, I can't come here and, and, and skip these things with an eight-year-old daughter. Oh no, no.
sounds awesome. Yeah. I should. I love all this stuff. Dr. Haxby is a, um, uh, actually a clinical psychologist by training. Uh, nobody knows that. It's so embarrassing. Um, uh, so <laughs> I'm also embarrassed. Uh, but, um, but he's been working in brain imaging and cognitive neuroscience for um, uh, a long time. Um, he, uh, I first met Jim when we were both at the NIH. He was um, in uh, the Aging Institute in Stanley Rappaport's laboratory and doing some of the first PET studies and then ultimately some of the first fMRI studies um, in aging and also in visual cognition. And, um, and in particular, he is extremely well known for um, understanding representation of objects, faces, and things like that in the brain, how they change with aging, but more importantly, he has developed some um, really fascinating and key tools um, for um, for understanding how to examine um, using advanced uh, imaging techniques, image analysis techniques, including um, um, multi-voxel pattern analysis, he's really spearheaded this work. Um, he is uh, currently a um, endowed uh, chair professor at Dartmouth, uh, the director of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience there, and the director of the Brain Imaging Center there, uh, and he also is a professor at the University of Trento. Uh, in Italy, so he has the, um, the benefit and joy of being able to travel back and forth and, and spend half of his time uh, uh, in, in uh, lovely um, Italy at the base of the Dolomites, which is like the best place on earth. Um, so uh, Jim is a regular here, and we're very pleased that he was um, uh, willing to come to this, our, um, our last public lecture of our last NITP. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Hansen. Well, thank you, Susan, and thanks uh, to Susan, Mark, and the organizers for inviting me back. I guess I didn't blow it last year. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and, and we, we, yeah, we do go back a long ways. I think you know, we were kind of at the, there at the beginning of functional brain imaging. Um, but um, I didn't think you were going to bring up my, my clinical psychology past. That, that was an unfair low blow. <laughs> Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is a project in which we're um, working on computational methods to build a common model of how the brain represents information, how the human brain represents an information in human cortex. And specifically, the issue of how there, there, there's a fine, we think, we, we've shown that there's a fine scale structure in the um, organization of, uh, the cor functional organization of cortex. And how do you capture that fine scale structure in a common model? Now, I just want to point out uh, that this work is really a, a, a team effort, and there are a number of people. I'll be showing some data from Andy Connolly and some data from Sam Nastase. And the software is all um, implemented on these platforms, Pime VPA, which can be downloaded with NeuroDebian, that Yara Kalchenko is involved in. And I really strongly recommend that you, you, know, you learn how to use these platforms because it's a great way to do this analysis. But then in particular, I want to highlight this guy, Swarup Guntapali, there he is, um, who really uh, played a key role in developing and implementing these methods that um, I'll be talking about today. And Swarup is right there in the middle of the auditorium, and you're going to see him uh, uh, at, um, at 4 o'clock. Is that when you're... Your, your workshop is, and he, he's going to actually sh have you go through some exercises using Pime VPA. Um, and then I have to also acknowledge uh, the collaboration that we've had a long-standing collaboration with these engineers at Princeton, headed by Peter Ramage. And then we've had we've gone through a series of graduate students. Cameron is the latest one, so we 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 burned through these guys to, uh, to develop these methods. So this is um, an outline of what I want to talk about. So first of all, I'll just try to uh, present what the problem is that we uh, decided that we wanted to address, which is how do you capture both the coarse scale and the fine scale topographies in a common model of cortex? This common, common model means common across brains. Um, and then I'll talk about the conceptual framework that we use to, uh, to address this problem, which is we don't think about uh, functional organization of cortex in terms of the, uh, the spatial coordinates of the cortex itself. 
we think about it more in terms of an abstract space that we call a high dimensional representational space. And I'll try to make clear what that means. Um, and then I'll talk about how we derive this common space using a method called hyperalignment. Um, and then uh, most of the talk will be on uh, point four, which is a series of validation tests to show you that this thing actually works. And then some con conclusions. Now this il slide just illustrates um, what we can do is one example of um, using neural decoding methods using machine learning. So this, uh, uh, this is uh, multivariate pattern analysis, specifically using a support vector machine to um, distinguish the brain's responses to six different species of animals, nicely organized into two species of insect, two species of bird, and two species of pr uh, primate. And this is Andy Connolly's work. And this is a confusion matrix that shows how well the classifier works. So when we look at the pattern of activity in ventral temporal cortex, and we build a support vector machine to distinguish the responses to ladybugs versus luna moths, you can see that ladybugs are classified as ladybugs about over close to 90% of the time and are almost never classified as another animal. And as a matter of fact, we can d discover a distinct pattern of response for each one of these species, including these very fine distinction between uh, monkeys and lemurs. And I have to say that some of the subjects in the study didn't know what a lemur was. So, <laughs> so but their brain you know, you know, produced distinctive responses to these two different species. Now the problem is that this uh, analysis is a within subject analysis. What that means is that the way this kind of uh, decoding analysis is done you take a subject's data and you divide it into a t training data set and a test data set. And the classifier is built on the training data. And uh, then its validity is tested on the test data from the same subject, which means that when you run an analysis like this, you're developing a new model that's tailored to each individual subject's brain space. Okay? So what happens if you try to do the same kind of analysis where you build the model, let's say, on nine subjects data, and then test the left out tenth subject to see if you can cl uh, classify these uh, stimuli. So this is a confusion matrix for a between subject analysis like I just described. And you can see it's just not nearly as pretty as this confusion matrix. And over here in the histogram, you can see that the overall accuracy goes from about 68%, 17% uh, being chance, down to about 37, 38%. So it's a drastic drop. So uh, whatever patterns we're picking up that are distinctive for these six species of animal are not shared across subjects if you line up the brain spaces of these subjects based on anatomical features. And this has been shown by other groups as well, that between subject uh, decoding analyses just don't work very well. And that's because we hypothesize that there's a fine scale grain structure in these patterns that's distinctive for each subject but the anatomical alignment doesn't line up the, the, the features in these fine scale topographies. So most um, models of, of cortical architecture uh, re, uh, are based on dividing the cortex into areas. And this is in, in, uh, goes back over 100 years to the work of Brodmann, where he identified 52 areas in cortex. And uh, this is a very... Uh, uh, long-lived scheme, and we still talk about brain areas often in terms of their Broadman number. Area 17 is striate cortex. Area 18 is peristriate cortex, et cetera. In a more modern version, Gordon, working in Steve Peterson's lab, Lauman and a group, uh, have used functional uh, connectivity as measured with uh, resting state functional MRI, and have used uh, a couple, some techniques using clustering and border finding. Uh, to identify 422 areas uh, that they say are relatively stable across subjects. Um, no, uh, Russ Poldrack has about 600 brain areas, but that's because he's Russ Poldrack. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, but if you'll notice that these areas in Brodmann map and this modern map have a border, and then within the area, it's assumed that everything's pretty homogeneous that this is a functional area that has, with, without an interesting topography within that. But these neural decoding results suggest there is a structure within these areas, fine scale structures that carries these important distinctions. 
between different brain states. And we know that there's fine scale structure in brain areas. So we, we, we know that from the, you know, the detailed work in early visual cortex. Um, so this is a, a, a map of the uh, visual areas in uh, retinotopic visual areas in early visual cortex. This is a classic paper by Marty Serino. Came out 20 years ago. And it's based on retinotopy. So there's a gradient of the retinotopic location in terms of polar angle from the horizontal meridian at the fundus of the calcarine sulcus to the vertical meridian at the border between V1 and V2. Then it goes from the vertical meridian to the horizontal meridian, et cetera. So that means within area V1, there is it's not a homogeneous area, there's a retinotopic pattern with a single cycle of variation in retinotopic location. If you go deeper into, uh, into V1, there are other topographies that are of even finer scale. There are ocular dominance columns. Now this is work using seven Tesla uh, uh, fMRI done at the University of Minnesota. And so here you can see the ocular dominance columns. Left eye columns are in blue, right eye columns are in red. And then in the same patch of cortex, you can find orientation selectivity columns with different orientations indicated by different these colors that has an even finer scale than this. So within area V1 and V2, within area V1, I'm sorry, uh, besides retinotopy, there's also ocular dominance columns, orientation selectivity columns, and there's other topographies. There are blobs and interblobs, things like that. So there are these fine scale structures in V1 that we know about are well described, and they're multiplexed into this complicated cortical architecture. Um, but when we get into ventral temporal cortex, most people still talk about areas. And these areas are specialized. And so this is from Nancy Kenwisher's paper in 2010 in PNS, where she shows the locations of areas that are specialized for face perception, body perception, place perception, and visual words. And this is more modern work by Grill, uh, Colony Grill Spector at Stanford, working with Kevin Weiner, Weiner and showing, you know, uh, again, the red areas are the face areas, and then uh, blue is LOC, and there's place area over here. But everything's divided into these functional areas with no real discussion about what is the structure within these areas. But there is structure within these areas, and we know that. So um, uh, we've shown that uh, you can distinguish between different the species of faces inside the face area. So the pattern of activity for a human face as compared to a dog face as compared to a monkey face, uh, the patterns are, diff are distinct. Even though the overall response in the FFA is equally strong for all of these species. Now in uh, recent work, uh, well, uh, that hasn't been, that's un under review right now, um, uh, by Swaroop working with Ida Gobini, they've shown you can distinguish, you can, um, distinguish uh, the ang head angle full profile, three-quarter profile versus full face, and identity in the same, uh, uh, that's independent of head angle in the FFA. So the FFA has these kind, this kinds of information embedded in some topography that we don't understand well uh, that can be uh, uh, harvested with fMRI. But even weirder than that, you can also distinguish the response to monkeys versus lemurs in the FFA, and you can distinguish the response to shoes versus chairs. So nothing to do with faces, which means that there's, there is a fine scale structure, even within a functional area defined as strictly as the FFA, um, that carries important information in terms of the, in, in, uh, what, what is represented. Uh, and we don't have a model for how that, uh, how, how that is structured. So the question this raises is, can these fine-grained topographies that carry fine distinctions be modeled in a computational framework that is common across brains? And it's a, there's a, it's a deeper question here. It, it, and that is, is there a common basis at all? So shared principles, features for these population responses. Because it's quite possible that each brain develops an idiosyncratic code. We each have our own idiosyncratic visual history. And it could be that the way you see a monkey and represent it in your visual cortex is the different from the way I see a monkey, even though we both can distinguish that monkey from a lemur, All right? So that's the question we set out to answer starting, what, 2008? Yeah. So the framework that we use is that of a, a representational space. And this is actually quite simple, um, but it's abstract. So you, 
a pattern of activity is usually shown as um, a, a, a pattern on the cortical surface. So this is the response to faces, this to shoes, this to chairs. And each voxel in this pattern is a column in a data matrix. And each row is the strength of activity in each voxel for each different pattern. So a pattern is a row in this data matrix. So we think of uh, the set of voxels as a high dimensional space where each voxel is a dimension. So this is a 10 by 3 matrix, but I, can't, I don't know how to show a 10 dimensional space in a two dimensional slide. So this is just a two dimensional representation. So you can see that the location of the two dimensional vector of the pattern, the two, two voxel pattern for these uh, 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 stimuli are in different locations in this representational space. So, we, and what we find is that by uh, instead of trying to do the analysis in the physical space of the brain, if we do it in the abstract space of a representational space, it becomes much more tractable. And so specifically for this problem, what we want to do is we want, we want to take the uh, different brains that have different shapes, different sizes, different patterns of folding, of sulcal folding, in which the voxel spaces are uh, idiosyncratic and find a transformation that will put it into a common space. So this is the transformation step right here. This sort of it's meant to show some kind of a rotation. So let's say we, so we have these people who uh, have these three brains looking at this stimulus. This is from the movie uh, Temple of um, Raiders of the Lost Ark with Indiana Jones. That's Harrison Ford. He's giving up the golden idol to the evil French archaeologist. <laughs> <laughs> now, so. All these subjects are having the same visual experience. But in subject one, the pattern in lateral occipital cortex may look like this, which would be a, a vector in this location is his representational space. Whereas subject two might have a pattern that looks quite different, although it's representing the same visual information. And so in that subject's three voxels representational space, the vector will be in a very different location from the vector for the same stimulus in subject one. And subject three has a different pattern with a vector in the different location. Now, later in the movie, Indiana Jones is escaping from the, um, the, the natives with the poison dart blowguns in an airplane. And so this visual experience will have evoked patterns that are distinctive in each subject with vectors in different locations. So now what we want to do is we want to see, can we f somehow find a transformation that will put it Martin, hi. <laughs> um, put the, uh, uh, line these vectors up so that the vectors uh, that show the pattern of response for um, Indiana Jones with a golden idol are, are grouped together, gr here, grouped together here, and the vectors for escaping in the seaplane are grouped together. OK? So how do you do this? So, uh, we derive these uh, transformations using something called the Procrustes transformation. And it uh, depends on a rich sampling of response vectors. So we have people watch uh, the entire length of, uh, uh, of the movie. So here's a scene from the beginning. And uh, so you could just get a sense for how this doesn't look like a psychology experiment. <laughs> Uh, people are watching the movie. The, the instructions are watch the movie and enjoy it. Um, and uh, there's the evil French archaeologist. <laughs> um, and uh, so as people watch the movie, we get patterns of activity to the same stimuli for each subject. And this is what patterns of activity, and these are synchronized for these two subjects. So this pattern is representing the same information, at least that's why I hypothesize, as these patterns here. And it's not obvious how they're, they're similar. So the way we think of this is, is, is kind of as a trajectory. As the movie progresses, with each time point, we get another uh, uh, pattern of activity in each subject. And that populates each subject representational space with vectors uh, pattern response vectors for um, the movie. So this is just an, exa an illustrative example with 15 vectors that are color-coded. 
And you can see that the, uh, you know, the red X is in different locations for these two subjects and these three voxel spaces. So what we want to do is we want to find a way of taking subject two's representational space and uh, rotating it so that the vectors are now in optimal alignment with subject one. So we have subject one space here, and we want to multiply subject two's representational space, which is just a data matrix, right? It's a two-dimensional data matrix, by a, an orthogonal matrix, which is a rigid rotation that we derive with the Procrustes transformation, to rotate it like that. And now you can see that everything's nicely lined up. And the vectors are now, for the same time points, are close to each other in the common representational space. Subject three, we need to get a new transformation matrix so that now subject three's pattern vectors are lined up and in the same location in the common model space. So we do this iteratively. We start with a subject. We rotate subject two to subject one. We find the mean vector, the mean pattern vectors for these two subjects, and we rotate subject three to the mean of subject one and two. Then we rotate subject four to the mean of subjects one, two, and three, et cetera. So it's an iterative process. We actually do this two times through. Here's, and so we end up with a common model space with multiple subjects vectors in that common model space. And we can calculate the mean location of the vector for each location. And now we can rotate any subject to that uh, common model space based on these pattern response vectors. Now, when they watch the movie, there are 2,600 time points when they watch the movie. So if we do this on half the data, which we have to do for proper cross-validation, we have 1,300 vectors. So this is a, a, a very rich data set for calculating, uh, trying to fine-tune this transformation matrix for each subject. So the secret are these transformation matrices. And this is what it looks like in terms of matrices. So we start off with the movie data in a brain space where the columns are voxels and the rows are time points, with 1,300 time points for uh, one half of the movie. And we find the subject-specific transformation matrix using the Procrustes transformation. This is a closed-form solution. It finds the optimal uh, orthogonal matrix to rotate this subject to the template. And it's a simple matrix multiplication. And afterwards, now we have the same time points. But now the patterns of response, instead of being in a coordinate space defined by voxels, is in a coordinate space defined by uh, these model dimensions, d1, d2, d3. So this is what we're trying to get, this, this transformation matrix. Now notice that what it's doing is it's transforming voxels to dimensions. It's, not, it's derived from data, from brain data, the, the, the functional responses. But this matrix can be applied to any data set in that same subject with that same voxel space. It doesn't have to be the movie. So in a sense, this becomes a key that unlocks that individual's neural code. Because you can take any data from any experiment and rotate it into the same common model space. So for example, we can take the responses to the six animal species, use the subject transformation, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, transformation matrix and rotate these patterns of response into the common model space, even though this transformation matrix is derived from the movie. And we even tested this. Swoop so went through and found all the pl places where there might be a bird or a, or a bug. There are actually very few in the movie. Took those out and, uh, and showed that it still works. Now, there was one more problem. The, first, the way we did this originally was with a region of interest. So we found one transformation matrix for that region of interest. And as neuroscientists, we didn't think it was feasible to do this for the, a good idea to do this for the whole brain. It's not really feasible because there are too many voxels for 1,300 time points. So you're estimating too many, vo too many parameters for a 20 or 30,000 voxel brain with just 1,300 time points. And the, uh, um, the Procrustes transformation was designed by engineers, applied mathematicians who really don't care about what it's rotating. So they will take data from any place in their region of interest and rotate it into locations anywhere else in that region of interest. And that's a real problem. So for example, it could rotate um, the uh, right temporal lobe into the left occipital lobe. And that doesn't seem like it, we're learning much about how the brain's organized if we scramble the brain in that way. 
So Swarup came up with a really n neat solution to this, which is instead of doing the transformation matrix, ca calculating it based on all the brain data at once, he did it searchlight by searchlight. So these are overlapping searchlights. And um, so he found a transformation matrix for each searchlight. And they're overlapping voxel to dimension transformations. So he aggregated those into a single transformation matrix by simply adding them up. So this is a sparse transformation matrix. Most of the entries are zero because those are um, transforming voxels into dimensions that are associated with distant parts of the brain. But now there's a single transformation matrix. That's this thing here that allows us to take an individual subject's brain anatomy and rotate that into a common model representational space that's high dimensional, or take a vector from the common model representational space, or a set of vectors, and rotate them back using the transpose of this matrix into the common model space. This is fully invertible. So that's the idea. Um, and you know, we, we put a lot of energy into uh, de developing these ideas and developing the, the algorithms before we knew it was going to work. So the question is, does it work? Or is this just, you know, is, is, is the answer going to be no? There's no such common structure, that, at least using this method that we can discover across brains. So let me go, just go through a few elements of this model uh, setup. So the, in the uh, movie, in the uh, in this space, each dimension has a common uh, response tuning function. So the response to each time point is more similar across subjects than the response for a voxel to the same time points. So did that work? So do we get higher correlations between the time series for um, common model dimensions between subjects than we do, uh, than we do for voxels? So this shows the uh, correlations between subjects uh, for the time series responses to the movie. And this, this pattern looks exactly what, like what Uri Hassan reported uh, in his groundbreaking studies using uh, movies as uh, stimuli um, with the strongest correlations in visual cortex, lateral temporal cortex, uh, ventral temporal cortex, et cetera. After um, hyperalignment, the correlations are about twice as strong. That means they're accounting for four times more shared variance across subjects. Um, and it's uh, in the same areas, but now we're finding significant correlations also in lateral prefrontal cortex and, um, and, and medial parietal cortex. So uh, much more extensive uh, uh, regions of the brain now are showing similar responses to the movie. So the tuning profiles of common model dimensions account for four times more variance that's shared across subjects. So this is not, this is not a small effect. It's not just statistically significant. It's a, a, a big jump. Now, again, in, the, uh, in this setup, a row in the, in the um, common model space is a pattern of response for a time point. And if this is working, that pattern of response should be more similar across subjects. And should be more, it should be easier to discriminate the response to this time point from the response to the other time points which should afford between subject multivariate pattern classification and higher intersubject correlation of representational geometry. So how do we do between uh, multivariate pattern classification and representational similarity analysis, looking at representational geometry with movie data? Well, it wasn't that hard, actually. So what we thought was we could try to classify the time points themselves. We derive the, the common model space on half of the movie, then we do this between subject classification analysis on the other half. And we say, if we pick out um, a short segment of brain data, 15 seconds worth of brain data, can we tell exactly what part of the movie the subject was watching when, they wa uh, when they, their brain produced those patterns of activity? And we do this with a, a, a very simple classifier, one nearest neighbor classifier using correlation distances, the distance metric. So we compare that pattern of activity in that subject to the pattern of activity in other subjects for the same time segment and all other possible time segments. So this becomes a 1 out of 1,300 classification <coughs> task. So chances is much less than 1%. Um, when we look at 
we, we do this analysis with anatomically aligned data, the only area that shows classification performance that exceeds 5% is early visual cortex. Okay? After uh, hyperalignment, we now find uh, classification accuracies that exceed 5%, again, covering uh, over half of the, of the cortex, including uh, lateral prefrontal cortex, as well as early visual areas, higher order visual areas, and auditory areas. Now, to try to, to get a more quantitative grasp of what you see in these nice pictures with you know, a brain on fire here and a, a brain that's barely glowing here, we identified 20 loci in the brain using the Neurosynth meta-analytic database uh, that is a summary of um, results from, I think, over 10,000 studies now. And uh, you can put in a keyword. You could go on, you know, on the web right now and, and, and look at Neurosynth, put in a keyword, and it'll give you a map of uh, where activation has been reported associated with that keyword, like V1, or the motion area MT, or the FFA, or early auditory cortex. So we identified 20 such loci from the Neurosynth database, where they, we had, that are most commonly associated with these things in other fMRI studies. And we looked at a searchlight around that, uh, that uh, uh, functionally defined location and did the between subject multivariate pattern classification uh, after anatomical alignment and after anatomical alignment, hyperalignment. And you can see that the blue bars for hyperalignment are much higher than the red bars uh, for all the areas. So we're getting significantly better classification in every pl functional location we looked at in uh, early visual, high order visual, early auditory, high order level auditory, and these um, co cognitively defined areas, calculations, expressive speech, and working memory. And on average, the classification accuracy in these loci was seven times higher after hyperalignment than after um, uh, anatomical alignment. So that suggests that this, these principles for deriving a common space are shared across <laughs> cortical fields that represent very different kinds of information. So that information shouldn't be redundant. So if, if they were all reflecting the same kind of information, uh, aggregating that information wouldn't help very much if it's redundant. But if there's different information, we should get even higher levels of accuracy if we can somehow aggregate the information across the whole brain. So to do this, uh, Swoop did a singular value decomposition to reduce the dimensionality of the whole brain data. And then he looked at classification for different numbers of, uh, of singular vectors, starting with you know, uh, 10 or something, going up to 1,000. Now surprisingly, you can see that the anatomically aligned data, that's the red line here, uh, now gives us a, a classification accuracy for these time segments of around 75, 76%, which is really pretty good. So there is information in anatomically aligned data about what's going on in the movie, which is the basis of Uri Hassan's career, right? Because he does anatomical alignment, and he's doing brilliant things with it. But after hyperalignment, the accuracy goes up to 93%. With anatomical alignment, all the information is captured with about 50, uh, 50 dimensions. In the hyperaligned common space, you need about 400 dimensions. So it's a much higher dimensional space with much more information in it, much more shared information about these um, patterns of activity. Now, another thing people always ask us is, geez, you know, this is great, but do I really have to waste a whole hour of, 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 of scanning time to have people watch this movie? And uh, so uh, this analysis was also done with shorter uh, data sets so just using 250 TRs, 500, 750, or 1,000 TRs. So this is about 45 minutes. This is about half an hour, OK? And you can see that with about a half an hour of data, it's not as good as all the data. More data are always better. That's general principle. The more data you can get, the, the better off you are. But if, you know, if, if, if funds are short, scanning time is short, if you just get a half an hour of data, it's almost as good. So this is uh, more practical. Now, what about um, uh, representational geometry? So this representational geometry comes from the work on representational similarity analysis that's been championed by Nico Kriegis Korte. And the idea is that instead of just asking, are the uh, brain states, these patterns of activity, different for different states, you ask, 
how different are they? So some things are quite similar to each other. Some things are quite different from each other. And by analyzing that similarity structure, you actually get a lot more information from your, your study than by just looking at whether or not the states are distinct. So this set of similarities is called representational geometry. So with a movie, you can think of representational geometry as how similar is the response to one time point to other time points. So you can imagine time points in which there's uh, Indiana Jones on the desert are going to be quite similar to each other, whereas you know, if it's a, 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 a scene in Nepal, um, in the tavern in Nepal, it's going to be quite different. right? And different areas will have different patterns of similarities and differences. So areas that are associated with audition may be showing the similarity of the, of the, uh, uh, the voices or the, su or the uh, soundtrack, the, the musical score. Other areas may be the similarity of the scene. Other areas, similarity of the people. So each area is going to have its own distinctive representational geometry. So uh, to do this, uh, we calculated representational geometry for the whole half of the movie. So that's 1,300 time points by 1,300 time points. It ends up being over 800,000 pairwise similarities. So it's a big, complicated representational geometry. And we looked at whether that uh, uh, representational geometry was correlated across subjects uh, in a searchlight analysis. And you can see that there's pretty good correlation after anatomical alignment in the usual areas. And those correlations are much stronger after hyperalignment. Again, it's about double the correlation. So uh, this is also doing a very good job of lining up the representational geometries, suggesting that it's lining up um, uh, different types of information spaces. So this, these computational principles seem to be applicable for different kinds of different types of information representations. So this just shows that broken down by area, same 20 areas. And you can see we get this effect everywhere we look with about, I think it's about a 1.8 full difference in, uh, in mean correlation across these 20 loci. So we had some, you know, we, we, we ran into reviewer trouble. I'm sure some of you have ran, ran into reviewer trouble. And Mark has never run into reviewer I trouble. <laughs> He's saying never, right? <laughs> so they, they said, you know, we don't believe it. We think that really what you're looking at is just, you know, global information that's shared across all these areas. You know, and that you're really not capturing with this computational model something distinctive about the information in each area. So to look at that, we did a second order representational similarity analysis. So now instead of just looking at the representational geometry within an area, we looked at the similarity of the representational geometry in one area as compared to the representational geometry in all the other areas. So this, there are 20 of these uh, uh, functionally defined loci. So we have a 20 by 20 matrix of the similarity of the representational geometries across areas. And this is the matrix, for the, the full matrix. And you can see some features in here that are easy to interpret, like V1 is different from everything else. And the visual areas are more like each other. It's this blue patch here. Auditory areas are more like each other. But it's hard to really get a, a, a fine sense of what's going on in a big, big matrix like this. So Sroop did a, a, a um, Dimensionality reduction using multidimensional scaling of these 20 of, of this matrix. And uh, this is a three dimensional solution that he, is shown here. And you can see the visual areas that are shown in red are clustered together and they're very different from V1. And the auditory areas are clustered together with the cognitive areas in between. So dimension one seems to be distinguishing visual from auditory with cognitive in between. Dimension two is distinguishing V1 from everything else. And this is dimension three over here with dimension one. And dimension three pulls the cognitive areas away from the sensory perceptual areas. So that's an indication that this representational geometries are reflecting something that uh, is consistent with our intuitions about what these different spaces should be doing. Now the areas, the visual areas are all clustered together and the auditory areas are, are all clustered together. And that's because MDS, again, is just a dumb you know, engineering uh, 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 calculation and it tries to find the optimal solution for all 20 areas at once. So it's not doing a good job of, of teasing apart the fine scale structure among visual areas or auditory areas. So we did a multidimensional scaling of just the visual areas and just the auditory areas. And again, we find structure here. So if we do multidimensional scaling of the visual regions only, the first dimension distinguishes V1 from everything else, 
And the second dimension distinguishes the higher order areas from each other. MTs down here, word form area, faces, and places. So again, this is very consistent with our, our pre-existing intuitions about what we think the differences are in the representational spaces in these areas. Auditory is a very similar answer. Dimension one is A1 versus the high order areas. Dimension two it distinguishes the high order areas from each other. This time it's more by hemisphere. Left is up here and right is down here. So this, we thought, allowed us to uh, uh, conclude that these um, uh, representational geometries reflect widely divergent domains of information. Now, our reviewers, you know, they were persistent. And, and then they said, well, you know, they don't, they don't you know, we, we keep talking about fine scale structure. They say fine scale structure, you know, Schmein scale structure. We don't believe it. And uh, they were, like, we're just picking up coarse patterns. So we said, okay, we have to take this seriously. And so this is, we did a couple of analyses, but I'm going to just going to show this one, which shows a, a, an analysis of the point spread function of the differences in the time series responses for uh, neighboring cortical locations, nearby cortical locations. So these are between subject correlations of the time series for the same location in the brain, either uh, anatomically aligned location or, um, or the, uh, uh, the uh, the hyperaligned location in the reference subject's brain, or neighboring locations, or locations that are one step apart, separated by one uh, 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 cortical node, or two steps apart. So that's what this cortical distance is. Zero is the same location. One step away, two steps, three steps, four steps. And what you can see is that for the anatomically aligned data, the correlation for a voxel with itself, this between subject correlation, is about the same as the, the correlation for a voxel and the neighboring, vo or neighboring cortical node, and really is not much different from a, vo a node two steps away. After hyperalignment, the, the, the time series for a node is very different from the time series from neighboring nodes, and even more different from the time series for nodes two steps away. So it, this shows that we're lining up a fine scale structure that's shared across subjects with a, um, a granularity of a single voxel. Okay, how many? So, then we, we, I, I promised that, th that this would work for other data sets. So we did this. We took the, the data from the um, animal species perception experiment, used the transformation matrices derived from the movie, put the responses to these animal species into common model coordinates, and then did the same kind of between subject classification analysis. And these are the results. Uh, between subject classification analysis after anatomical alignment shows uh, classification that exceeds 30% in early visual cortex and, uh, and lateral occipital cortex. Um, after hyperalignment, we see uh, cl classification in early visual cortex, ventral temporal cortex, lateral occipital cortex, much more extensive. And this is the within subject analysis. Uh, and you can see that these patterns are almost exactly the same with almost exactly the same temperature or reflecting the le level of classification accuracy. Now, actually, they're different. And, it's, uh, and, uh, and they're different because these are a little bit higher than these. So this is something that people objected to when we first started showing this because we had results back then suggesting that we could get better between subject classification after hyperalignment than within subject classification. And they said that's impossible because we must be able to build the best model of someone's representational spaces based on that subject's own brain, because there must be some differences between subjects. And we said, yes, that's obviously true. The problem is that when we do functional MRI experiments, we are limited in how much data we can collect in each individual subject. And, um, and so the, the limitation for within subject analyses is based on just the practicality of how much data can you collect. So unless you're Jack Gallant, that's quite limited. And um, so we, we, instead of having a training data set of just part of a single session, we now have a training data set that's based on 9, 10, or 12 subjects. You can go up to 30 or 50 subjects if you wanted to. And you can get a much more precise estimation of where the uh, location of these response pattern vectors should be uh, based on that. 
that is more accurate than you can get with the limited data from a single subject. Now we've gone on and we've done these kinds of studies using other movies. This Indiana Jones is sort of our, our anchor, but we have people watching a nature documentary to get uh, uh, better alignment of uh, representational spaces for animals. And we ha have people watch The Wire. How many of you have seen The Wire? Oh, that, I'm so happy. It's the best TV ever made. <laughs> and <laughs> we chose that because we thought that was a, a socially complex drama with very interesting three-dimensional characters. Um, so this, this work is being done by Dylan Wagner, who's at Ohio State now, and he promises to send me a manuscript in the next t uh, few weeks. I, I hope he does. Um, a uh, huh? A screenplay or a manuscript? A screenplay or a manuscript? A manuscript, a manuscript, yeah. Now, I just want to highlight one study. This is by Sam Nastase. Uh, he's got this nice Italian last name, but he's quite American. But here he is in, <laughs> here he is in, in, in Rovereto having a cup of espresso because he was a, a student at the, at the CIMEC where I work in Italy. And then he's now a graduate student working with me at, at Dartmouth. And he had subjects looking at videos of behaving animals. So this is uh, three of these video clips. With a, uh, is that a gorilla? I think it's a gorilla. And um, a hummingbird and some kind of caterpillar. So they're very different species, but they're all doing the same thing. They're all eating, right? But the, the way they eat is very different. So the motion vectors of how they accomplish that act of eating is very different. But we cook, immediately recognize that, these, that they're, they're eating. I'll talk a little bit about, about more about this in my, in my uh, next talk. I just want to show one thing, though. He did hyperalignment based on responses to the nature documentary, and then looked at the between-subject correlation of representational geometry for these uh, uh, stimuli that have different animal behaviors and different animal taxa. And he got what we, what we showed with the other movie, which is about a doubling of the correlation, <coughs> between-subject correlation of representational geometry. So this is just another example of that this works. So now I want to show you uh, that the, the reverse uh, process works. You can take a vector that has a location in the common dimensional space, and using the transpose of the rotation uh, transformation matrices, you can project this vector back into the representational space for each subject, which is a location in a voxel space, which can be viewed as a, a, a topography, as a, as a pattern of response in that subject's brain. So the first point I want to make, that I want to make sure you understand this, and that is that a dimension in the common model space is not mapped to a single voxel in each space. It's actually mapped to some oblique orientation. Okay, so it's a weighted sum of the voxels in individual brain spaces. So this column in the transformation matrix, which is the column for a dimension, it has a set of weights, a different weight for each voxel. And you can view this as a pattern of weights in the subject's brain spaces. So this is two subjects data with three arbitrary dimensions that come from lateral temporal cortex. And you can see that uh, the pattern of weights for subject two and subject one are quite different from each other. Okay. Now, the way this works is that a pattern of activity is a weighted sum of these um, uh, weights for each dimension, each dimension, OK? So for any pattern of response, it's based on a set of weights, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, or beta i, j, k. But now, in the common model space, these weights are the same. So does that work? Well, in this analysis, uh, we had eight subjects with retinotopic data. So we had the retinotopy mapped in these subjects in addition to the movie data. And uh, we could map out the, uh, 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 the retinotopic map in each subject. So this is one subject. And this, this is this subject retinotopic map with the, order, the border between V1 and V2 and V2 and V3 mapped. This is a polar angle map. So horizontal meridian is yellow, vertical meridian is blue. Then, 
group took the data from the other seven subjects and using the transformation matrices from the, derived from the movie, he rotated those subjects, retentopic maps into the common space, and then rotated them, them into this subject's brain space. So we could have a map of the retinot retinotopy in this subject's brain space, but based on other subjects' data. Now, does that work? This is the result. It works amazingly well. So this is, the, again, the horizontal vertical meridian, but this is based on other subjects' data and the, the maps. This even has fine scale features to it. So there's this bump in the, map, in the border between V2 and V3 that you see in, in his own data and you see it mapping from other subjects' data. Okay. Now I'm gonna go quickly through the, what we're, we're working on right now. Um, and that is uh, the, 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 based on this. We find that even the brain connectivity patterns are better aligned. So if you look at the correlation between um, uh, the, the time series response in one location and then responses from uh, targets all over the brain, that connectivity vector is much more strongly correlated across subjects after hyperalignment than after anatomical alignment. So this is a much better job of aligning functional connectivity across brains because we're not only aligning the, the uh, time series in the, uh, the, uh, the seed location, but also in all the connectivity target locations. This is a, a, a large effect. And this made us realize that we could derive the transformation matrices on connectivity patterns rather than time series responses. So uh, it's the same structure, but now this pattern is the pattern of connectivities for this location in the brain uh, with this uh, region of interest. So the region of interest now has a pattern of connectivities uh, with different locations in the brain. So now it's not different time points or stimuli, it's connectivity targets. And you can, now we have a space that's a connectivity vector space. Repre and uh, each uh, target location has a vector in a different location. So once the data are in this structure, then the engineers take over, and it works just the same way as it did for time series responses. So you can do hyperalignment based on a connectivity matrix rather than a time series response matrix. Now, does that work? It worked really well. So this is the between subject correlation of connectivity vectors after anatomical alignment, after hyperalignment using the method I've described before based on time series, and this is after based on the hyperalignment based on connectivity you can see it's stronger. And surprisingly, uh, these connectivity patterns have a fine scale structure. So if you look at the connectivity after anatomical alignment, again, the connectivity of neighboring cortical locations or even nearby cortical locations separated are about the same. But the connectivity pattern for a, a cortical location and its neighbors is quite different after time series hyperalignment or after connectivity hyperalignment. So this reveals a, a, sp a fine spatial granularity. Once you can do hyperalignment based on connectivity rather than time series responses, you no longer need to have all the subjects watching the same movie. They can watch different movies. Or they can be doing nothing at all, which is what most pe people seem to be doing with fMRI these days. You put the subjects in the scanner, and you just say, relax. You know? and, and you measure resting state functional connectivity. And there are these vast databases now of resting state um, fMRI data. And uh, anyone can download it, including Swaroop. And so Swaroop downloaded data and analyzed 20 subjects who had two sets of data. He derived common model space based on the first set of resting state data and then tested on the second set of data whether the connectivity vectors were better aligned. So this is the between subject correlation of connectivity vectors uh, after sulcal alignment, which is the standard alignment that is done in the Human Connectome Project. And this is a high threshold of 0.7. Uh, after connectivity hyperalignment, the correlations are much higher. So it works very well on standard data. And this is what, 10 minutes of data that you based it on? 15. 15 minutes of data. 15 minutes of resting state data. You can get a reasonable estimate of, a, uh, of the transformation matrix for each individual subject. 
And it shows that in the human connectome project data, there is a fine scale structure of the patterns of connectivity. This again is this point spread function. The uh, anatomically aligned data show almost no difference until you get three voxels away, three cortical locations away. Uh, but the hyperaligned data show that there is you know, point by point in the brain, the pattern of connectivity is distinctive. And you can ca capture the commonality of those distinctions with, with, uh, with hyperalignment. Okay, so let me make a few conclusions. So uh, this, is, this is a big complicated thing, and there's a paper, there are two papers out now. Sroop's paper, Guntapalli et al., came out in cerebral cortex this year, and the first paper came out in Neuron um, five years ago. So it takes a while to, get your, to wrap your head around it. Um, and uh, so just to give you sort of the main anchors to help you get started understanding it, their basic components are, are first, the common high-dimensional representational space. The second is individual transformation matrices that allows the data from a voxel, individual voxel space that's idiosyncratic into the common model space and the reverse, projecting data from the common model space back into individual spaces. And the algorithm for um, calculating these transformation matrices and deriving the common model space is called hyperalignment. So these um, common model dimensions are, um, are troublesome beasts that take a, it takes a long time to figure out everything that they're doing. They each have a distinct a, a response tuning function that's common across brains, or more common across brains than the response tuning functions for voxels. Uh, these response tuning basis functions help you model population responses that carry fine distinctions that are common across brains. And they capture variations with a fine spatial granularity. And they're valid for diverse domains of information. The functional connectivity vectors um, are also common across brains and also capture variations with a fine spatial uh, granularity. Now, in the, um, the, the common model dimensions in the transformation matrix, the weights are topographic basis functions that are individual specific and they allow them to model individual variations in functional topography with high fidelity. So the common model accounts for the fine-grained structure of cortical architecture and the coarse-grained aerial topography. So it captures a distinction between V1 and V2, or FFA and PPA. Um, so it captures the common bases for fine-grained structure of local variations in response tuning and functional connectivity profiles while preserving and modeling individual variation of coarse-grained aerial topography. So how big a factor is this? I mean, what is, the, you know, uh, um, so we're talking about fine-scale structure. Is this important? Well, when we're talking about uh, the brain's variation in brain activity during a more natural uh, experiment, experience like watching a movie, this common model accounts for four times more variance in those variations. This is not a small step. And it affords seven times higher between subject multivariate pattern, cl pattern classification. So you really can think of this fine-grained structure as the dark matter of cognitive neuroscience. So the, you know, the, uh, the way we've been analyzing data before, looking at average responses in areas, is like the visible universe. But then we have this invisible universe that was invisible before because we didn't have the computational way, you know, the, the, the cognitive neuroscience telescopes to look at it. But now we have a way to start looking at that. And it's, it's big. It's, it's, it's accounting for more of the variation in uh, functional brain architecture than just the aerial topography. So um, I'll end with this. These, again, you know, are, uh, to, uh, this is Michael Hanke. He was in the lab. He's now at the University of Magdeburg. Eric Kolchenko, when he had hair. And this is Baker Tower at, uh, at Dartmouth. And they are the um, developers of PymeVP and NeuroDebian. And all the software for hyperalignment and the data are now on this website, so you can, you can look at it. And the paper is, um, is now published uh, in Cerebral Cortex on the whole brain uh, model. And thank you for your attention.